Okay, there we are. My homebrew antenna solution is something that I built for myself. One of the things I've always had an interest in, and since I've been a member of SMC for over eight years, one thing that keeps popping up is SO2R, SO2R. Well, in order to do that, you have to have two radios and you have to have antennas and filters and all that good stuff going on. I needed a solution that I could work as soon as possible. And I felt it was easier to start tackling my, my station before I start tackling a radio. The first thing I wanted to do was automate the switching. So that's what this process is for today. Just so that I'm clear on what this presentation is, it's a walkthrough of my process. This is not a how-to presentation. This is not a, if you wanna do this, this is what you need. This is more of a, of a build log, build diary of how I got my solution implemented. And I'll be honest, I'll tell you what I did right, and I'll tell you what I did wrong, I'll tell you where I had to start over, and that's kind of where this is. It starts with my ideas, where I did for prototypes, dead ends or limitations that I found. And just so that you understand, this was not something that I did last weekend and decided to present it. It took over 18 months as very iterations come along, you, you, you read up, you find out more information and you want to move forward. And sometimes you have to wait when you have to purchase new stuff. So every project needs goals. My goals were basically automate antenna usage. I wanted to take away the manual aspect. And while a lot of people still use manual antenna switching, if you've ever been on 80 meters on uh, any contest at you know two in the morning and you hop up to 40 and you wonder why you're not hearing anything, it's because you didn't select your 40 meter antenna. I want to take that out of the equation. I want my system to take care of getting my antennas chosen for me. Two basic goals of what I do is I contest and I DX. So any solution would have to be a able to allow me to contest at the level that I'm expecting, but also to support DXing across any bands that I choose to chase DX. And also it has to be aimed towards, I want to do SO2R, I want to have a second radio, so whatever solution I pick has to play with that second radio. <clears throat> Here's what we're starting with, or what I'm starting with, and that's my radio. I've got an IC7300, which is an excellent radio for doing SO1R. I've got a hex beam on the roof of my single story house, which covers 20 through six. I've also got a fan dipole at 25 feet for 20 and 40, and I have an inverted L for 80 meters. The 80 meter inverted L, I manually have to configure for 160, so it's usually not something I do during a contest unless I feel I really need to go down there to do something. I run outside, do my reconfigurations, and that's okay in the summertime, but when you're trying to do that in January, it's just not practical. One caveat, I have two antennas on 20 meters, and believe it or not, I use them both in just about any contest. Here's what I was using back when I was thinking about all this. And yes, this is what used to be stuck on my wall. And yes, that's a sticky note telling me what I have. Nothing fancy, nothing dynamic. I've got an AB switch, which chooses my hex beam. And then I would switch it the other way and it would go to the MFJ tuner box, which actually has two ports. And I would just reach over on the antenna tuner and select antenna one or antenna two, and it would work just fine. This situation worked a lot of times, but a lot of times I would get the indication that I was on the wrong antenna because I would see the SWR indication fire off on the antenna tuner. So that's what kind of got me thinking I needed to better automate what we've got. So as I was thinking about this, I looked around at what a lot of other people have done. I have visited other stations. I have seen what other people have. I researched it on the web and I said, well, I could go with a commercial off the shelf solution using a two by eight switch. I could use band data for control, which is what most people use. And I would also need band specific switching to integrate things like triplexers and diplexers to attack both of my multiband antennas to allow that second radio to operate as interference free as possible. But that's the challenge. You have to have a combination unit or a single band filter, which adds to the complexity, but it's not unusual. This is kind of what everybody talks about when they say, I want antenna switching. Unfortunately, the 7300 has a data port out the back, but it's not transmitting BCD band data like you get on other contest ready radios. You can put an interface on it and you can break it out and you can send it, but it's something you have to do. Not a showstopper, but it's something you have to think about. Second, the, the typical switch 
you see is a two by eight, which covers only eight antenna ports. That would give me eight antenna bands, which sounds practical, but I've got two antennas on 20 meters. Two antennas on 20 meters, that's interesting. Keep an eye on that one. So as I started thinking about it, I, I begin to realize that a commercial solution wouldn't work. I've dealt a lot of years in my professional life as an IT person where trying to fit your way of doing whatever it is you do into a commercial product can sometimes be counter to the function that you're trying to serve. So a commercial solution wouldn't give me all the bands that I needed and it wouldn't support the fact that I've got two antennas, which is interesting, but I'm glad I made that decision because now instead of spending money to buy a solution and trying to make my life adapt to it, I was going to have to make my own. So I started thinking of things as a different strategy. I was trying to think of bands because I wanted to be able to have SO2R on 10 meters and 15 meters or 15 and 40, and I wanted to do that. But I, I, the more I thought about it, the less practical that became. So I stopped thinking of bands and started thinking in terms of antennas. Okay, I got antennas, I got three antennas. So if I say radio one's on antenna one and radio two's on antenna two, I could, I could make that work. Okay, I, I, I've got that now, so I like that idea a lot better. I would construct something for a minimal switching unit, whether I buy something or build something. That was my expectation. The hard part is, what do you do with controlling? How do you control such a beast that you've created? Remember, I'm trying to think of SO2R, so I've got some ideas of how to make that work. And lastly, what about 20 meters? It's kind of funny because as I was, as I was putting this presentation together, I, I was trying to, trying to figure out what's so special about 20 meters. And the interesting thing is I came to the realization that 20 meters is what I referred to in my notes here is a serendipitous restriction. The more I think about this, the more I realize that having two antennas on, on a single band is what drove my solution to be what it is today. And had I not had that, a different solution would have taken shape and you'd have a 10 minute presentation or maybe even a commercial solution. So that's kind of interesting. So let's start with the controller. How was I going to make my solution interface with all the stuff that I wanted to do? I had the expectation that a normal switch would use normal station shack power of 12 volts to switch the various antenna connections. So I said, well, okay, we can kind of work with that. So my first go was I reached for a Raspberry Pi. If you don't use a Raspberry Pi, you should. It's a fun little toy to play with. I had one laying around. I grabbed it. I reflashed it with a new version of um, the OS so I could start new. I had on hand one of the relay boards, which is a Sane Smart 8 relay relay board, which you see there on the right. And I said, okay, we can make this work. Honestly, if you've ever done any work with Arduinos or Raspberry Pis, this is a very simple operation. You just tell the, pro, the, the Raspberry Pi what ports talk to what connections on the relay and you could do it. I created a simple relay um, program that would allow me to click the relays and it worked out really well. It was manual, I admit it, but it was just a short step from manually doing that to automating that. I know how to program so I could actually make that happen. One of the issues that you have is you can have a Raspberry Pi do whatever you want. It's basically a computer, a reasonably powerful computer. Now, it's not going to compete with your desktop. You're not going to be mining Bitcoin at a rate of 100 per day, okay? But for a simple task like this, it can work very well. It also has onboard Ethernet and Wi-Fi. So whether you want to plug it into your network or just connect it to your network by a Wi-Fi, that's fine. Very good in that regard. It also has a real-time OS. Real-time OS just means that things happen in real time and you don't have to wait for something else to happen. Things happen concurrently because of the processor and whatnot. Th this is not some toy operation. There are people who take these Raspberry Pis, put various digital mode programs on there, whether it's Whisper, WSJT, or whatever. They put these in a little box, go out into the field with their portable radio, and they make contacts. Soda guys love this stuff. Some of the digital Whisper guys love this stuff. These are powerful solutions for what they do. If you look deeper into the MFJ1234, which is their uh, remote rig control device, they're running a Raspberry Pi to do all of this. This is a very capable solution. It's a basically a Linux computer. So if you have any experience with Linux, you'll be right at home here. And it also has sufficient control pins. Those are those little pins on the right-hand side that allow you to interface with external devices. That's where the power comes from. It's not just a computer where you plug in a single device. You can program whatever you can connect to those ports. However, this was my first kind of 
things that bothered me the most about it. The Raspberry Pi, being a computer, takes time to boot up. You boot up your computer on your desktop, it takes a certain amount of time. You want to do something with your computer that requires a restart to solve an issue, it takes time to restart. I was concerned about that being a contester. Uh, the story that I came up with is I was talking a few, a few weeks ago with my field day friends as we were discussing. And one of the things that I'm sure you've all seen when you're running, you're sitting there staring at your, at your radio and you're typing your calls and you're making your contacts. And you reach a point in time where you realize, oh my gosh, I haven't had a QSO. And you look up at your QSO timer and you say, it's been 15 seconds. And you start frat, you know, frazzing out about it going, wow, I haven't had a QSO in 15 seconds. And then it goes on to a minute and you start saying, my gosh, where is this? And that's kind of the experience I, that I kind of realized I didn't want. I didn't want to have a, 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 an issue come up with my switching where I had to restart my switching and then have everything go offline while my Raspberry Pi booted up. So that was going to be a concern. Second, the Raspberry Pi writes to an SD card. Now you can use external storage, so I'm not gonna go into that, but it writes to an SD card. Being a real-time operating system means that the Raspberry Pi is doing stuff regularly. It's logging actions that are taking place on the system. It's checking details based on what is happening, whether it's network traffic or programs you have running. It's reading and writing to that SD card regularly. It can suffer what are referred to as improper shutdowns. If you reach over and pull the plug on your Raspberry Pi and it's not doing anything important, no big deal. You put power back to it, it boots back up and you're off and gone. If it doesn't shut down properly or worse, it shuts down while it's in the middle of doing something to the disk, like writing a something to one of its various log files or interfacing with the one of the other things where it's, it's pushing data, it is highly likely that the SD card can become corrupted. Now, it's not a big deal in many cases, it doesn't happen. A lot of these other devices use it, but it was a problem for me, basically from firsthand experience. I had, over the course of trying to get the Raspberry Pi solution morphed into what I wanted it to be, I encountered three uh, improper shutdowns. Two of them required me to just reflash the SD card, put on my latest changes, and I was back in business. The third one, however, is what really changed my life. The SD card was no longer usable. That's right, the SD card was no longer usable. It wouldn't take a format, it wouldn't take an image, and I didn't want to be sitting there during a contest, experience a power failure, and suddenly my antenna switching goes offline because of a corrupted SD card. Now, was the card corrupted because of an improper shutdown, or did the card corrupt itself somehow, which resulted in a shutdown of some kind, and it just never recovered? I don't know, I wasn't going to do the forensics on that, but it was a dead end. I wasn't going to be able to use the Raspberry Pi the way I wanted it to be. I didn't want it to not perform. I didn't want it to be a bottleneck. I didn't want to say, yes, it's cool to use a Raspberry Pi, but I was just confused. So I was trying to figure out, okay, what else can I do? So I went back to the drawing board and says, okay, what else do I have that I can work with? I've used Arduinos way back since like revision one. I think I got a couple of them laying around here that still have DB9 pin connections to them, don't even have USB. I had one laying around, a, a slightly more modern version of one that actually had USB. And I says, okay, well, we can do that. We can throw together a quick program. And being a, what is essentially a microcontroller, I'm not gonna go into the details, you basically put a program on there and when you apply power, within moments, that program is running doing what it does. The nice thing is it's considered a hobby board, much like the Raspberry Pi, and it can interface with a lot of the same devices that a Raspberry Pi can. It's amazing how many ways you can find to use an Arduino if you just put your mind to it. The one thing that's limiting on the, on the Arduino is it doesn't have native onboard Ethernet or Wi-Fi. Now there's an asterisk there because I've had Arduinos all along and none of them have ever had internet connectivity. Over the past six or eight months, there have been versions of the Arduino which have come out, which do support various versions of either Wi-Fi or onboard Ethernet, but they're twice the price of a normal board, upwards of more than the cost of a Raspberry Pi. I had some uh, Arduinos laying around, so I just went with those. You could use that, you could avoid a couple of the complexities if that's what you want, but it's a cost issue. I had the board, that's what I used. Since the Arduino does not have um, onboard Wi-Fi, you have to come up with a way to give it. Well, fortunately, there's an ESP8266 module, which is the device in the center on your screen there, which provides Wi-Fi connectivity. It easily interfaces to the Arduino. You just connect a couple of those pins to a couple of the pin slots on the Arduino and you're off and running. So 
looking deeper at the ESP8266, now I'm not trying to sell you on this thing. I'm just showing you this is where my mind was evolving. It programs like an Arduino. So you use that little interface board on the right. You basically snap the little guy in there, stick that into your USB port, and you can talk to it just like you talk to an Arduino and say, well, okay, you can write some information to it. You can do stuff. The interesting thing about it is you can either have your Arduino say, okay, daughter board, this is what I want you to do. Go do it. Or you can tell the ESP8266 on the board itself to say, here's how you connect to my Wi-Fi network, and you just send the traffic down the stream. You tell the Arduino what it needs to know. That's pretty cool. But it only has two pins for communicating other information. So if you wanted to take this little device and do something with it, how far could it go? The interesting thing is, since it's got two data pins, you'll find a lot of projects out there where people use this specific device powered with like a battery back solar panel setup where they're monitoring like humidity or temperature in like a, a, a greenhouse, a grow house, monitoring their, their beer production or whatever because they're simple little devices that you can honestly, that thing's not much bigger than, I mean, you see the USB plug on the right side, that thing fits in the space of the board portion of that. So it's a tiny little device, hook it up to a humidity sensor and it automatically can Wi-Fi. It's very efficient with power. So there was hope there but it wasn't going to be big enough. So I went back to Google again and was searching around and I found a larger profile version of the ESP8266, which actually has more than 10 pins. I say more than 10 pins because depending on how you leverage the functionality of this particular device, which pins can be available. So you can have at least 10 more if you don't use certain functionalities, but that's not important. I looked at it and was thinking, this is pretty much what a networked Arduino kind of should be. It has all the power within reason that you get from a basic Arduino. And understand, there are various forms of the Arduino, a big board, a smaller board, a real skinny board that doesn't even have pins. It's just got places to solder connectivity to it. But I was looking at this going, wow, this is kind of what the Arduino should have been. I don't know why they had to make a new one, but whatever. So I was looking at this going, wow, this is interesting. So I got my hands on a couple of these and was trying them out and sure enough, they worked as expected. I could probably use this. So instead of having an Arduino and an extra Wi-Fi connectivity place, I got this. So I just reduced my parts count by one. So what will it take to make it work? Using the Node MCU, I was expecting that my power would be supplied by 12 volts. That's where I'm gonna power the relays. So that's where I'm gonna power this thing through. Unfortunately, like most of your, um, board processors these days, they run on about five volts because they plug into USB. So I grabbed a buck converter, which is the device on the left-hand side of your screen there, and tweaked it. This is an adjustable one, not a fixed one. This is an adjustable one. So I adjusted it down to the proper voltage for five volts. And then I would feed the ESP8026, the Node MCU board with five volts. It would do what it has to do just fine. It outputs 3.3 volts on its output pins and the relays on the same smart uh, relay board, which is in the top right there, the blue device, are five volts. Now, there's anecdotal evidence that those work fine, but I wasn't satisfied with that. So I went out to, um, drawing a blank, anyway, uh, I went out and found a level converter, which basically allows you to put voltage on one side and voltage on the other. And when you trigger it, it says, well, that's the voltage you use. That's a glorified relay, but it's basically a level converter. It converts to 3.3 volts out of the node MCU to five volts, which trips the relays on that board over there. And that's kind of where that goes. I was concerned about local RF and I don't know if 3.3 volts was gonna be enough to do it without interfering. Okay, now that I had a working idea of what I wanted it to do, I kind of knew I could make this work and I'd done some basic testing, but I didn't really have anything in, in particular. So I said, okay, what do we want to do? How are we going to use this? Well, first up is computer control. I'm a contester. I want my computer to tell it, this is what I want you to do. My second one is I'm a DXer. I would like to have some way to tell the system, I want that antenna, fine. And then the last one was an external control. I wanted to switch. I wanted to be able to reach up and go click, that's what I've got, or click, that's what I got with LEDs, buttons, and switches. So those are what I was looking at from the beginning one. I started off with input control from N1MM Plus. That's what I use for my contesting, and that's what I have set it up. N1MM conveniently outputs a glob of information using XML, broadcasts it over the network, and sends information regularly that allows you to do whatever you want with the data. 
It also sends packets of information that tell you specifically what radio you're on, think SO2R, and what antenna you're on. If you've told N1MM about your antennas and you tell Radio 1's on Antenna 1, that information will be communicated by N1MM, just thrown out on the network. The real concern for me was, being an IT guy, the node MCU wasn't going to be powerful enough to consume XML in a reliable fashion. I deal with XML all the time, and trust me, it's a nightmare. There are libraries you can use, but the overhead is just enormous. I, I knew what I was going to do. I read through the specifications coming out of N1MM, and I said, okay, I'll do something else. I'll find some other way to deal with N1MM's XML. And I decided to write a program that aggregates the XML coming out of N1MM into what I need to tell the node MCU what to do. So basically what I did is I settled on a simplified structure that basically tells node MCU, okay, node MCU, radio one wants antenna one. That's all it needs to know. That's all it needs to know. So I created a program that I could run on my primary PC, which could gather the information from N1MM and ship it off to the node MCU. It allows XML to be parsed on a practical machine and it makes the logic of digging through the XML part of a program that is easier to understand instead of trying to stuff it into a microcontroller and wonder why it bottoms out later on. So in order to make this work, you got to tell N1MM everything it needs to know. First off, I went into the antenna section. You see, I got on, I'm on the antenna section. If you don't have this configured in N1MM for your one antenna, consider doing it. Just consider doing it. Put your antenna in there, identify the bands, set it up so that you have it. You'll if you ever get to the point of wanting to do this, now you're already there. But there you can see my three antennas. Antenna one is the hex beam covering 40 through six contest bands. Um, the dipole, which does uh, 40 and 20, and the inverted L. Now the inverted L, because it's a manual configuration, if I tell it to go to 160 meters and it takes that antenna, it'll do it whether it's resonant or not. And you also have to tell N1MM to send out this information. By default, N1MM doesn't necessarily send out all this information. And you can see on the screen here, all the stuff that it wants to send out to the world. The only thing I was interested in is sending out radio information. So I've got it on my local network there. It might be hard to see on your screen, but it's 1.2168.1.255, port 1260. The 255 says just send it on the network. I don't care where it's going. Somebody's out there listening. And that's what my XML aggregator program does is it sets out there and listens to it and says, wow, I'm listening on port 1260. That's where N1MM is sending its stuff. So I'll just listen there. So it listens for the data. When it finds a packet of interest, in this case, I'm only interested in the stuff talking about the radio. You can see a lot of other stuff. And if you turn all that stuff on, it's a lot of traffic that it has to receive, whether it, it respects it or not. So I'm looking for radio information. And then I take the information, strip it down into what's necessary for the control packet to tell the node MCU what to do. And then I ship it off for that. The second program was going to have to be something that would allow me to sit on my computer and pull up DX. I see a spot for something I want to work. How do I tell it to do it? Not all programs interface with all antenna solutions. In my case, I have a homebrew antenna solution, so I can pretty much guarantee that just about any software is not going to know how to talk to it unless I go down the path of trying to emulate a known interface for uh, computer selection. So I just created a simple standalone application. It allows me to bring it up on my machine, and I click hex beam. Boom, click, it does it. It does the exact same thing that the aggregator does by sending a control packet to the node MCU that says radio one wants antenna one. Those buttons are all controlled to say that same thing. That's all it does. Now the external control unit, you know, the more I thought about this, the less I realized how functional it would be. I was concerned that I would have to have a head unit since it's talking over Wi-Fi to tell the node MCU to select an antenna, this device would also have to talk over to Wi-Fi. So it's no longer just a couple of switches. It would have to have some intelligence, some smarts. I could either have it construct information that looked like N1MM's information that I could just piggyback on that aggregator, but that requires yet more complexity. The more I looked at this, I just kind of thought, you know, maybe I don't need that. So I decided that at this time, I'm not concerned with an external controller box that sits on my desk somewhere. So here's what I've put together. I took a solderless breadboard, and if you don't have these for prototyping, go get one, they're awesome. So what you can see on the left-hand side, there is the buck converter. Now it's not wired in because I was just plugging straight into the node MCU, which is there in the center with USB. I had this sitting on my, on my, on my desk next to my radio, and I've got it driving LEDs, which you might be able to see in the green LEDs on the right-hand side. I had put all these pieces in place, and I had this just sitting on my radio, and I was just sitting at my radio. I fired up in one mm I, I walked through the bands, 
<coughs> excuse me, I walked through the bands and the, so the selector software actually selected antenna one, antenna two, antenna three, antenna one, antenna three, antenna one, antenna three, almost as fast as I could cycle through them, which was really cool. It was a short step to take the LEDs and point those connections at the relay board. So I knew I could do that. I had done that. I had my relays clicking. I was happy. So now I was looking at, how am I going to put this somewhere? I don't want this ugly little proto board sitting around. So my solderless breadboard is there on the left-hand side. I happen to know that Spark Fun, which is where I got this um, solderless breadboard originally, makes a templated solder on board that mimics the profile of the solderless breadboard. So if you align all your pieces and cut all your wires and set all your bits, you just take the indexes on the solderless breadboard and transfer them to the proto board, the red board there in the center, and you're in business. No, no, no having to um, go into a software, a complicated software, and learn how to write a, a quality board that either you etch yourself or you send off to a fab house and wait six weeks for it to come back. I want to realize you got a fundamental flaw. You know, I built it on the breadboard. I transferred it. I soldered it and I was good. Now I was smart enough to look forward and say, I'm using pin headers and sockets for putting all my stuff on there, especially the node MCUs and whatnot. Cause if I have to replace them because they get fried or if I want to take it out to upgrade it, or if I want to have different profiles to use, I just use the solderless connections in it to allow me to just insert them like that. And when I put that together, I didn't take a picture of it. Shame on me. So here's a pork shoulder I did a few months ago. You might have remembered me talking about that. So it's either this or a picture of the dog. So now that I had my, my controller put together, I kind of had to figure out a way to put it somewhere. I didn't want it sitting on my wall like that. It was just too naked. So I looked at using acrylic. I got some acrylic. I could cut it and glue it all together. Well, that's tedious, time consuming, and I don't know, I ne wouldn't necessarily be happy with it. I looked at electrical boxes. I looked at sewing boxes, pencil boxes, and I was a cruising Amazon one day just taking pot shots and anything that said box in it. And I ran across this nice acrylic display case that, that, that fit my dimensions that I was expecting. And I said, okay, I'll just go with that. That's fine. So now that I had the controller in place, what was I going to do for my switch? What was I going to do for the switch? It's time to start switching antennas. It's not enough to just think I'm selecting an antenna. I want to actually pick an antenna. So I look at that and goes, oh, okay, this is easy. I'll just grab some relays. I'll grab some SO239s. I'll lay them on something and I'll connect them up with the relay bits in the middle and I'll make a thing where I can connect to it. <sighs> As simple as that sounds, and as often as you'll find projects where people do very simple things like that, the shortcomings of those projects that you see out there tend to be that somebody's doing it for an SO1 setup, a one radio setup where they don't care about uh, isolation or interaction between antenna ports, or they're not worried about things that go on with the switching itself. So I was going to have to look deeper and try to find out. I wanted two radios down the line, so I had to have protection. And I didn't know how I was gonna solve that if I just wired it up myself. And the deeper I read into it, the more I realized that isolation was going to be key. Now, some people get isolation by putting their antennas way out the far flung ends of their property. I don't have a lot of property, I'm on a suburban lot, so my antennas are gonna be fairly close to one another. Second, you want isolation between the ports themselves. They don't bleed over into the other ones. The more I read on that, I understood it, I understood it, but I didn't know how to measure it, nor did I have any equipment to measure it. So it wasn't going to be as simple as me just soldering up some wires and making sure they were all the same length and hoping it was going to be good enough. Radios cost too much to fry them because you're too proud to think of something else. So in across my various lookings around, I came to the fact that I need some way to switch this guy and I found the KK1L 2x6 antenna switch. He sells you a board which is really cool. It's got six ports, so it's a two by six. It's got a two radio design, and it's got 60 plus dB of isolation measured. This board has been measured by somebody with the skill and the equipment to measure any two ports are at least 60 dB of isolation. If you read the literature out there, you'll find that 60 dB is, is like the, the watermark. The nice thing is being a board, he sends you a mouser product list that you just click the link, go out to Mauser, he's got all the parts list listed, you click it, you send it, you ship it, and out the door it goes. A few days later, it shows up on your desk and bang, you're in. Now I've got parts, but no board. 
Well, he shipped it out and it came the next day. And his parts list luckily includes a box, a aluminum prefabbed box that is big enough to hold the board itself. So, wow, I didn't have to think about any way to put that. So when the board came, I laid it on top of this blank um, chassis, marked it all up, marked it all up some more and continued to mark it. I'm not a fabricator, so I probably didn't do this as effectively as I could or ever should have. But then I started uh, working on the board itself. I started soldering on the bits. Now, for those of you who like you know, solder stuff, this is like, you know, solder porn or whatever. But that's basically what it is. I put on the diodes and the capacitors, and those are the low 50 ohm, uh, 50 watt resistors across the bottom. I don't profess to know why they're there. It has something to do with isolations and whatnot. But hey, somebody else designed this board that knows a lot more about it than I do. And there's the 18 relays, which do all the switching for all this stuff, along with the control header on the bottom. And there are all the SO239s mounted on there. And there it is stuffed in. Yeah, I breezed over a lot of that, but honestly, it's, it's just a solder job. It's not much to do. But there's the antenna switch. Well, I wasn't happy with just having that little lovely um, scratched up aluminum looking stuff. So I, you know, scuffed it, prepped it, primed it, painted it in poppy red. If you ever know what color that is, that's poppy red. I had a can, that's what I used. And there it is with everything plugged in, turned on, hooked up, labeled, finished. That's what the device looks like. It took a little while to do it. I'm not going to lie. It wasn't, you know, a 10 minute solder job. It took about a half hour to solder all the components on. It took me about an hour, hour and a half to punch holes and make sure they were all straight. But once I put it all together, it just went together quite nicely. So how was I going to mount these things? Now that I got a, a controller box, that acrylic little box and this guy, what was I going to do for mounting? I could have drilled holes, could have put cleats or little picture hook hangers and stuff. The controller box is fairly light. But the antennas aren't. The antenna cables are, you know, RG213 cables. They're going to be heavy. I'm going to have to mount this in such a way that it doesn't fall off when nobody's looking. So I went with these. These are called French cleats, otherwise known as Z-channel. If you have a microwave installed above your stove in your kitchen, it's using a long version of these in most cases. I figured that was the easiest way to go. So I grabbed these off uh, Amazon and off we go. So here we go. Stick it on the wall. Bang. There it is. Let's just do a brief walkthrough. On the right-hand side is the antenna box, which you've already seen. In the lower left, port A goes to the radio. Port zero on the upper right goes to um, my hex beam. My dipole is number one, and my inverted L is to the left. You know, we were having a discussion last night about labeling your stuff. Well, there are all my cables labeled, so I know where those cables go. The controller box, which is on the left-hand side, um, has my board mounted up with all the stuff, you see the buck converter at the top, you see the node MCU there in the center and the con uh, level converter at the lower end of that with the wires, the blue and white wires, which go over to the uh, blue relay board, which are all hot wired to 12 volts. That wire that's got the little um, wire nuts goes over to a fused port on my rig runner power distribution node. And the little wires in the middle between the two are the ones that connect the relays. So that's what I've got. What do I think and what should I do? I used it for working DX. It's pretty easy. You fire up the program, you select the antenna, and you make a contact. I used it for QSO parties. I fired up N1MM and got in on a couple of QSO parties. The limitations of QSO parties tend to be the limited number of bands that people use. The reason you're using the short bands, you know, uh, the 1480 meters for near-end contacts, and rarely for 20, so I didn't get a, a good exercise for the whole thing. I did a full system run during the CQWPX. I put in over 24 hours, made over a thousand contacts, and I was exercising that thing as often as I could think of. Well, let's hop up to 15, see what's going on. Well, let's go back down to 40. Let's go to 20. Well, let's try two antennas on 20 and pick which one's working for me. So I gave it a workout. It was up for all 48 hours. And honestly, honestly, it never missed a beat. Never stuttered, never stammered, never waited, never held me up. I never had a problem transmitting onto the wrong antenna and it was just effortless. I also did it for my field day operation this year when I was working at home as 1E. I also did it during the IARU. By now, I'm looking at this thing going, this just works. I don't have to think about it anymore. And when I got to the NAQPs, it's just like, I'm just operating. I'm not giving it any sort of second thought. Quite frankly, it just works. So what can I do for the future? Well, I can convert the normal relays to solid state relays. Sane Smart makes a board that can replace this or normally clickety-clack relays with solid state relays. It's about twice the price of that board. I've got to add second radio support. Since I don't have a second radio, I don't have any way to really test it, but all the functionality is there. I'll need functionality for selecting filters, and I'll probably need something to automate my 160 solution. Anthony, you have about 10 minutes. QSL. I have a parts list here because people ask me about 
all these questions. This is like the number two most asked question. How much does this cost? I've got the KK1L switchboard, which is only 40 bucks. But as you can see, the Mauser parts are 140 bucks. That's because you've got relays and SO239s or whatever. If you've got those yourself, you can definitely save space on that. I've got the Node MCUs, the relay boards, the proto boards, the butt converters, level converters, acrylic case, and the French cleats. A quick question comes up when I try to say, well, how much did the Node MCU cost? You don't buy one. I bought them in like a five pack or something. Same thing with the butt converters. They came in like a pack of six. I only needed one, so I, but I bought six. Same thing with the French cleats. They come in a sleeve of, of 20. So can somebody else build this? This is the first most question, most often question I get asked. I put it at about a six out of 10. You have to be able to fabricate. You got to drill holes. You got to connect up wires. You got to do some basic circuit design. But this is a circuit design about where you're worried about the characteristics of a transistor and will it go into whatever those technical things that EEs always talk about. It's just connecting modules that are readily available. And you have to do some basic programming. It's not the end of the world, but it's available to you. That's what I've got. That's my solution. It works. It's on my wall. I'm looking at it right there. Anybody have any questions? Thank you, Anthony. Um, there were two questions. You answered one about the costs. Um, okay. We do have one current outstanding. And if you have any questions, I do encourage you to ask them now. We've got about 10 minutes, nine minutes left to, to answer questions from, for Anthony. Uh, the current question out there is, how much power can the small red color relays in your antenna switch box handle? Uh, you'd have to look at the specs, but they're rated at 240 volts, something, something, something. I mean, they're just, you have to look on the specs on the KK1L website. He'll give you the full specs on the relays that are in there. They're rated to do what they do, if that was your question. I mean, obviously, if you start hot switching them, all bets are off, but I, I try my best not to be hot switching. So that's one thing that this solution doesn't have that other solutions do buy them because they drive off the PTT of your um, transmit setup to say that if you're PTTing, I'm not going to allow you to switch the relay. So my solution does not include that. Anything else? Um, not currently. Um, I do encourage you to ask questions. Use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. If anybody has any additional questions for Anthony, now would be a really good time to ask them. Wow, I was expecting to... Um... I was expecting to see more of that. Okay, we do have a couple more coming in. Okay. Um, have you thought of using this solution with a receive only antenna and would there be timing issues? Receive antennas are a byproduct of what your radio can do. If your radio can support receive antennas, you might as well use that functionality. The IC7300 that I have does not have a dedicated receive port. However, I do have the I think leave us the NRAD modification that allows me to break out the RX path. And I use that for the low band contest, the 160 and sometimes the 80 meters where I hook up something. So you could use a second iteration of this certainly to control any number of receive antennas or since the program isn't exclusive based on how I've put it together, it's not exclusive. Now it tries to deal with the fact that I know I've got three primary antennas and logically you're not gonna be transmitting on two of those at a time. But fundamentally I could take any one of those other unused relays and say, if the situation comes along like this, then I could switch this if I wanted to. And it doesn't have to switch the antenna switch. It could switch something other than the antenna switch. It's just 12 volts. You know, send it to whatever functional piece you want. You could create a second end uh, relay board like the KK1L version that I've got on the wall, the red one, or a similar solution to allow you to switch your receive antennas. They don't have the same uh, issues that a transmit antenna does because no, there's no real power going to them. But yeah, you could certainly do that. Thank you. Uh, probably a very quick question here. Do you have a GitHub repo for your code? I have put my stuff up on GitHub. It's a private repo at the moment, but if anybody wants to let me know what it is, mostly because it's a still a work in progress. I'm making sure I'm trying to document. I'm trying to get all my stuff solidified. But if you have questions, you want to see what I've got, I'll send it to you. I'll send you the link on GitHub and you can pull it down and look at it. Okay, we've still got, we got a few more in here. Okay. Um, what wattage will it switch? What do you mean what wattage will it switch? The, the relay board itself, the one that actually tells the antenna switch what to do, it'll handle whatever it can handle. But the uh, KK1L switch box, the two by six is rated at, rated at legal limit. It'll handle legal limit power. And when they measured, you'd have to go read the specs on the guy that actually did the isolation measure. He was measuring it at 1500 Watts. So 60 plus DB at 1500 Watts is, it's pretty decent. 
Okay, and this, this next question probably goes along with that uh, in, in, a, in a way. Anthony, how much power do you use in your installation? I'm barefoot, I use 100 watts. 100 watts. So I've got, I've got different levels of issues than somebody who's firing up an amp because I don't make my garage door open. I don't flash the neighbor's lights. I don't, you know, have my stuff kick out when somebody fires on the microwave because I turned on my amp. No, I don't have that problem at all. Not that it's not a problem I wouldn't mind having, but I just don't have power in my station. It's all 100 watts. Okay. Um, it looks like a two-part question here. Have you had any noise issues with the buck converter so close to your switch box or radio? No, I have had zero, zero. I had an issue with the past with my uh, uh, K1 EL uh, wind gear sitting in close proximity to my radio where I was getting RF into it. It had to do with the um, USB cable didn't have the little um, ferrite lugs on it. So I just switched it out for a USB cable that did actually have the little um, uh, suppressor lugs on it. So I know what that's about. I have had none of that with this. I get no RF going to the switching box. I get no RF coming out of anything. I mean, I don't get like, you know, phantom relay clicks or anything like that. It's, it, it just works. So I've got good isolation in my setup. Now, would it work necessarily in somebody else's setup? That I don't know. But in my setup, no, I do not experience those problems. Okay, uh, there's a, a follow up to the question about the receive antenna and is uh, what I was getting at was could you use this to control a receive antenna antenna with a radio that does not have a specific input for a receive antenna. And would there be a timing problem. Um, yes, you could use it for this, but there are probably simpler solutions out there. I believe MSJ makes a um, transmit receive switch device. There's also those old, um, what are they called? Some of the old timers will know it. Uh, was it Dalkey? Or something along those lines that would allow you to do that and be far less complicated. Now, if you wanted to switch three or four antennas, a Dow key will only switch one. But yeah, fundamentally, you could use this to switch when everything. I mean, there are designs where people have taken the KK1L board and daisy chained them where they have on the left side is your radio input and they're driving band filters that's coming out the other side, which is taking the other half, which is another KK1L switch that is deconverting that back and then sending it off to another switch which does an antenna. So they're doing the switching to say, I'm on antenna two, which is 20 meters, select the 20 meter bandpass filter and go along. So yeah, whatever you can configure these particular ones to do. And honestly, with my controller setup, you can switch whatever you want, whatever can take 12 volt power and say, do something, which is what I might actually do for switching my uh, 80 meter inverted L, just put the um, matching solution for 160 out there in a box and put power over coax to drive it and then I would just have to have a relay somewhere that says, yeah, actuate the power over the relay so that I can switch it to 160. So, I mean, it's a two part issue here with um, your switching antennas and the other half is the brains to know what, when, where and why to switch. Okay, and, and one last question here, I think. Uh, does the final version use an Arduino? If so, which version? You know? No, it does not. It uses the Node MCU. I had a couple versions of the Arduino and I was happy to use them and I would have gladly used them. But when I came across the 8266 in the form factor that I did, the Node MCU, it pretty much obviated the need for having an Arduino. All the logic and functionality is basically on the Node MCU to do what the Arduino does. Now, there might be some limitations to pitch on which Arduino, how much capacity, processing, throughput, ports, etc. But for what I wanted, the Node MCU is the, is the bee's knees. It does what I wanted it to do. All right. And there, there is a comment that's not a question, but just a, a thank you for an excellent presentation. Um, with My that, pleasure. thank you very much, Anthony. Um, and we will go ahead and wrap this one up and get ready for our next one. Thank you very much. Thank you.